We're in the book of Ezra, so we just are really just getting started. So let's go to Ezra chapter 1. Ezra chapter 1, and we've really only read and commented on the first three or four verses there. We ended our introduction of sorts last time by mentioning verse 3. Let's read that again. Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God which is in Jerusalem. And Sister Everett uh, and I were talking afterward about the, the scripture is very clear that uh, Jerusalem belongs to Israel, it belongs to the Jew. It does not belong to um, anyone, any other nation in the world. That is the place God said he would set his throne, and we expect Christ to reign there from there someday. It does not belong to the Arabs or the so-called Palestinians, a term which didn't even gain currency until after the 60, Six Day War in 1967. Um, go, if you will, to the book of Ezekiel for a, a minute. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 43. Ezekiel 43, and one verse there, verse 7. And he said unto me, Son of man, the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet, where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever, and my holy name shall the house of Israel no more defile, neither they nor their kings by their whoredom nor by the carcasses of their kings in their high places. Ezekiel 48, Ezekiel 48, um, Verse 19, um, no. they that serve the city shall serve it out of all the tribes of Israel. And also verse 35, it was round about 18,000 measures in the name of the city from that day shall be, the Lord is there. That is where Christ intends to set his throne and from which he is going to rule and it's been customary since about 500 A.D., thanks to the, the uh, Catholic popes in particular, to refer to a church building as the house of God, which is false. Uh, nothing could be more ridiculous. Um, now, some guys go so far as to say because there were no church building structures in the book of Acts or in the New Testament that to build one, is unscriptural. Uh, they want to be so scriptural they become unscriptural. Uh, let's suppose somebody was a good Bible preacher, a good Bible teacher, and he had uh, 200 people that wanted to hear him preach. Where are you going to put them? Or, or heaven forbid, 500, 600 people that want to gather regularly and meet, uh, meet with this fellow and have him teach them the Bible. Where are they going to go? Are they going to sit in your living room? Are they going to all be using one bathroom? And you know, where are they going to park? And so to build, and in our, in our country, we have the privilege of building church buildings and the government recognizing a duly organized church building with uh, tax privileges and so forth. And if the Lord gives us that blessing, then I, don't, I can't see it being a sin to avail ourselves of it. I think church buildings serve a great uh, purpose. Now, there are many church buildings that God has never been in a day in their lives. And there are a lot of them that uh, kicked him out, and he hasn't been welcomed there in 50 years. He's like the Lord Jesus in Revelation 3.20 on the outside knocking, you know, standing at the door wanting to get in. But um, there are some quote-unquote church buildings where God has never been in. Um, and nor, nor is Jesus Christ welcome there. 
because they don't even have the gospel. They don't even they don't know what they're doing. To them, church is about social contacts and uh, religious ritual and format and tradition, none of which has anything to do with the needs of the soul. Uh, and yet, that's where all their investment is put. Um, also, no, notice the expression "free will offering" in verse four and in verse six. The words "willingly offered" are found. Free will is a Bible term. It's a Bible expression. The Calvinists' uh, sovereignty of God is not a biblical expression. Um, free will um, is scriptural. The Calvinist idea of the five points of Calvin and Tulip and the sovereignty of God are not scriptural. Um, look also at Ezra 3, verse 5. And afterward offered the continual burnt offering, both of the new moons and of all the set feasts of the Lord, that were consecrated of every one that willingly offered a free will offering unto the Lord. And also chapter seven. And verse fifteen. And to carry the silver and gold which the king and his counselors have freely offered unto the God of Israel, whose habitation is in Jerusalem. Ephesians 2 verse 1 says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. And uh, the Calvinist belief is that if a man is dead, how can he uh, of his own choose to receive Christ or choose to be saved? And though, so they, they figure... The man's completely dead. God has to do the choosing for him. And that's where the, that develops into God's eternal decrees. He chose some to eternal salvation, and he chose others to eternal damnation. And men have no free will that plays into that at all. You and I are completely at the whim and the mercy of God to hopefully choose us to be saved. But, I mean, just go up the corner of our street here and turn right on the corner of G and Grove Avenue. There's a, a Sovereign Grace Baptist Church. They're hard, diehard Calvinistic, and they do not believe that you have a free will that can choose to receive Jesus Christ. doesn't matter how convicted you may feel. Calvinism does not allow you the freedom or the power to of your own to choose, I need Jesus Christ, and I'm going to turn to him. Uh, God either has to do the saving for you, or you will not be saved. And um, those are what the, the Calvinists call God's two eternal decrees. He uh, chose some to, they call it, he chose some to election, and chose some to reprobation. Those will be damned uh, no matter what they do. And the others will be saved no matter what they do. And uh, <clears throat> they've misapplied a couple of verses, Romans 9, 16, uh, which says, It is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. And Philippians 2, 13, <clears throat> For it is God that worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. <clears throat> Therefore they teach that you cannot receive Christ before God regenerates you uh, on his own. And then you just sort of go through the motions of pretending that you're receiving Christ when he's already done the work for you. I don't know why you would need to make it official by going forward in the church. That just seems like formality. But um, uh, you cannot will to receive him, nor can you will to do anything for him after you are saved. All of that is subject to his whim and his decision. This is how extreme... Um, the Calvinist doctrine is. Some churches don't push it as hard as others do, but that is nevertheless what John Calvin effectively taught. There's nothing in the universe or in the lives of men that was not preordained by God and decided beforehand by God. But, uh, and I say they misapply those verses because those verses would mean that God is responsible for any sin you may commit after you're saved. 
ultimately makes God responsible, that they malign the character of God by their doctrines. Uh, but let's keep reading here in Ezra 1, of verses 5 and 6. Then rose up the chief of the fathers of Judah and Benjamin, and the priests and the Levites, with all them whose spirit God had raised, to go up to build the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. And all they that were about them strengthened their hands with vessels of silver, with gold, with goods, and with beasts, and with precious things, beside all that was willingly offered. Verse 6 is self-explanatory. Back in 1 Chronicles chapters 28 and 29, there's a similar um, story, similar account, where King David gives Solomon... Uh, instructions on gathering gold and silver and all the building materials necessary for the construction of the temple in time. But uh, verse 5 here tells us that the southern tribes of Judah and Benjamin led the way in the return from Babylon back to uh, Israel, back to the land of their homeland. Not Israel, the kingdom of Israel. The ten tribes of the kingdom of Israel, the northern tribes, had defected from following the, the lineage of David in, in the throne under Rehoboam, the, or not Rehoboam, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, as he's often uh, titled repeatedly, the son of Nebat, back in 1 Kings chapters 12 and 13. Jacob had prophesied that the scepter shall not depart from Judah, Genesis 49, verse 10. Uh, the individual tribe, the prophetically of the southern territory, and also the descendant of Judah, specifically the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And um, or he's also called Shiloh, until Shiloh come. And after the Lord Jesus Christ, there will be no other king. He will be the king of kings. Um, and I'm going to I'm not going to go very uh, long tonight. I sort of ran out of time in preparing yesterday and uh, and uh, tonight. But uh, right now, and we'll go back to what we were discussing last week. Right now, there is the a mosque of Omar, which sits where the house of the Lord once stood. The temple built by King Herod was completed in about twenty. B.C. Uh, it's the only and and one wall of that is the only remaining structure called the Western Wall or the Wailing Wall, where the Jews uh, traditionally mourn and they pray for the temple to once again be rebuilt. And just east of that is the uh, closed gate called the Eastern Gate of the old city. Sometimes it's referred to as the Damascus Gate. It was called the Golden Gate. And it seems like there's another term for it. But you know what I'm referring to. Um, Christ and his disciples went in and out of that gate to get to the Garden of Gethsemane in their day. And just outside that gate today, that, that gate was sealed by Muslims back in 1541, and it's remained sealed until today. But uh, just outside that gate, to the east, there is a, a Muslim cemetery um, right in the way of uh, the access to that old gate. And it was, it's been speculated that the Muslim... Um, Oh, uh, what's the right term? Uh, Sultan, in 1541, closed that gate, sealed up that gate to keep the Jews' Messiah from coming back into the city because he was already familiar with the Jews' expectation that their Messiah would come uh, through that gate to take his rightful place as their king. I don't know if he had that much in mind, if he saw that far ahead, might have just sealed it off for some defensive purpose so no one could attack the city from that direction once the Muslims gained control of the city centuries ago. But um, turn, if you will, 
lastly for tonight, to Ezekiel chapter 44. Ezekiel 44. And notice verses 1, 2, and 3. And he brought me back the way of the gate of the outward sanctuary, which looketh toward the east, and it was shut. Then said the Lord unto me, This gate shall be shut, it shall not be opened, and no man shall enter in by it, because the Lord, the God of Israel, hath entered in by it, therefore it shall be shut. It is for the prince, the prince, he shall sit in it to eat bread before the Lord. He shall enter by the way of the porch of that gate, and shall go out by the way of the same. We were watching, um, I think it was something on the Travel Channel, one of these guys that's a big uh, host of the Travel Channel programs. Uh, he goes all over the world, you know, taking his cameraman along, uh, filming all kinds of locations and visiting them all. And he was spending, a, an, I think, an entire week with Benjamin Netanyahu, who was giving him a personal tour of all the sites of Israel, places where he had fought when he was in the Israeli army young, in younger years. And they got to the sealed up eastern gate of the old city, and Netanyahu said, you know, it's believed that the Messiah uh, will come through that gate one day when he returns, or when he comes, rather. And uh, I think the, the, uh, the, uh, the host of the show said, I'm, a lot, some people think he's already come and gone through there. And, of course, they had to chuckle, yeah, that's true. Christians believe he's already come and gone through there once before, and he'll come again. But when you think about it, what that means is the Lord Jesus Christ is going to have to tread on the graves of unbelieving Muslims to go through that gate and take his rightful inheritance. Muslims who have long since died and gone to hell without Jesus Christ. Um, Psalms 2 verse 5 says, He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. God shall have them in derision. People will spend a lifetime, religions spend all of their energy trying to get around Jesus Christ, to avoid Jesus Christ. And uh, to mock Jesus Christ, Muslims do not believe Christ was crucified on a cross. Um, and they believe he was a much uh, a far inferior prophet to Muhammad. And, and the, uh, the idea of sin and um, being accountable and responsible for your own sin and then having to do something about it by being reconciled to, the, to God through the Lord Jesus Christ is what the unsaved man doesn't like. And uh, Muslims are no different. Um, they want to try to get to heaven any, by any means except through the only one that can save them, and the Lord Je that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so they create a false concept of heaven. You know, martyrs will go immediately to heaven or, and get the, the 70 virgins and so forth and so on, dying for the cause of uh, Islam and Allah. And the popes, uh, well, was a, I think the, not Pope John Paul II, but one of his advanced men who was, uh, went with him to Israel, one of his spokesmen, um, said that Allah is simply another form of the term Elohim, the, the Hebrew word for God. And um, the, the word Elohim is found in Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And that, in English, that I am ending means that the word is plural. So Elohim, uh, the word translated God, throughout the Bible, signifies something plural about it. 
not just one. We believe in the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And uh, the name of God seems to suggest some sense of plurality in his identity. Although the Jews, they deny the Trinity as well. Yet the word and the spelling of their own, in their own language seems to stand in their way. But uh, Allah is not simply another name for Elohim. Allah was the name of a moon goddess in um, Arabic mythologies, and Muhammad got rid of all these different gods and saved that one, and then built an entire religion around the idea that Allah was a, a male deity, but uh, historically it's not, it's can't be proven, can't be supported. Well, anyway, the idea that the Lord Jesus Christ has to respect the religions of other people who despise him is a strange idea indeed. A strange idea indeed. And if, if the Lord Jesus Christ won't think twice uh, about trampling on the graves of Muslims as he enters into the gate, of the eastern gate which will once again open up for him and take his rightful place in a on a throne in Jerusalem as king of the world and the universe by extension if you won't think twice about that then um, it really makes you wonder how much respect you and I ought to give obviously we have to live in this world and we don't have the authority the Lord Jesus Christ has so we uh, look for opportunities to tell someone about Christ if they're willing to hear it, if they're willing to listen, uh, to be a witness and talk to someone about their soul and their need to be saved. But uh, the fruit of Islam, I like, you know, today Billy Graham's casket was put in the Capitol Rotunda for a public to pass by and view his casket. And I think he's only one of four civilians who's ever who've ever had that uh, honor and uh, there Franklin Graham was standing greeting a long line of American citizens passing by wanting to offer their respects and I remember after 9-11 Franklin Graham uh, made a clear point that those planes weren't being flown by Presbyterians they weren't being flown by Methodists or even Catholics or Baptists or Lutherans and they weren't being flown by Jews. There was only one group of people who, who are still uh, so barbaric. They don't know how to contend with the modern world except just kill them. And their clothing styles in many parts of the world haven't changed in 700 years. And um, so it's a sad thing because those are... Those are still lost souls that God wants to save. It's easy for us to get angry and hateful as American citizens, oh, well, Muslims, Arabs, and ragheads, and all. And yet, as Christians, you and I can't let ourselves go down that road and stay on that road. We need to get back on the right track and understand that there are... Um, those are people who need to be regenerated and saved yes. by the, the Lord Jesus Christ. 